our series of online presentations hosted and produced by the gallery's director, Stephanie Booman, and Amanda Konishi, the gallery registrar and manager. Please visit the gallery website to view all archived exhibitions and curatorials. Of note are this year's artist talks with Alana Mandelson, Belen Zako, Tara Gear, and Lori Heller Marcus. Four compelling conversations that complement their online exhibitions on Artsy and the gallery website, www.jasonmccoyinc.com. As we head into summer and hopefully celebrate what that means for all of us, we also celebrate the publication of art historian Stephanie Booman's fifth volume of interviews documenting contemporary women artists. To date, over 80 chapters have captured their art, their life, their practice, and serves as an important archive, all published by the Green Box. Rhineland Studio Conversations, the most recent publication, is timely to our talk today, as it is a reminder to the years that Stephanie was instrumental in seeing Terrell establish a studio in Berlin and have significant time in Germany. It is also an arbinger to Terrell's upcoming monograph, co-authored by Stephanie herself. In the near 40 year history of the Jason McCoy Gallery, the majority of contemporary artists we have represented first formed through the admiration of the person herself. The painters Gregor Muller and Philip Smith come to mind to be later joined by Cora Cohen, Helen Miranda Wilson, Leonard Stokes, to name a few. Each of these artists came to know, we came to know, through, through intimate relationships, often outside of themselves, which influenced our aesthetic, our intellect. A good number of these artists became personal friends and through them, the culture of the gallery formed. The public exhibition space of the galleries was to give a form to living, working artists that we gravitated to while the financial necessities of business were fulfilled through the commerce of blue chip sales and involvement with our historical work with museums and institutions. Thankfully, although not easy, we've seen and been a part of a number of careers that have shown great growth and as importantly shown an astonishing summation to the commitment to creative thought, to quote my friend Alison DeLima Green, as she once described Terrell James. Terrell is most representative of the culture and dynamic we attempted to build through the gallery. But to describe that shared history, we have to remember two equally influential and dear friends, Walter Hopps, and Virgil Grotefeld, which connect us to the place and energy of Houston, Texas. In the mid 1990s, Jason McCoy formed and sold what is now the core holding of works by Jackson Pollock to the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Here again, the memory of Carolyn Law, Peter Marzio and Barry Walker Impressive individuals that define the history of Houston and specifically the MFA H. With their enthusiasm and the vital support of Louisa Seraphim, this collection was received into the museum by Allison DeLima Green. Shortly thereafter, Jason McCoy introduced me to Allison and Walter Hobbs, whom I am sure he knew through Nicholas Wilder and David Hockney in his early years in California. On one visit to New York, 
Walter encouraged our meeting of the painter Virgil Grotefeld, which opened a long but too short lived chapter with his death in 2009. <clears throat> On one visit to Houston to curate a gallery exhibition of Virgil's, I was visiting with Allison, who was giving me a tour of the museum. And upon returning to her office, I noticed a work that I remarked on and she stopped and spoke to it. It was an oil, an oil of terrors. The painting stayed with me and later that day, I asked Allison if she could make an introduction. She did and I was thrilled. That evening over dinner with Virgil, I told him of my excitement to meet the artist. In all humor, he nearly broke a glass as the friendship of Terrell was his territory. And as I learned for good reason, given their long shared history and deep friendship, it followed a golden decade where the three of us, Virgil, Terrell and myself were self self-assured, not just in our friendship, but in the work we did through the gallery. The support we unconditionally gave to each other in furthering our lives, our endeavors, however far afield. The connection with Houston only deepened in those years as Virgil and Terrell further introduced me to not only the city's collections and their history, but to Houston's distinctive energy and the intellect that forms her culture. It attracted me strongly as I found that that energy to be something that for me, New York itself had partially lost. Terrell described to me uh, something to the effect that Houston doesn't have much natural beauty to distract you. Communities are close knit where genuine conversation and connection form larger ideas. This description resonated with me recently as in those years, a parallel friendship with the great Houston gallerist Meredith Long formed. I first met Meredith in Seattle, Washington while with my uncle and Barney Ebsworth and not knowing where or who he was Meredith became in some large part, a mentor and influencer of mine. And of course, years later, nothing delighted me more than to introduce his wife, Cornelia and their daughter, Martha, then running the gallery to a shared love of the work of the fellow Houstonian, Terrell James. There are too many individuals to name and describe here and now, but I wish to convey in this opening is Terrell's embodiment to a significant history of the gallery and of course our lives. I am also trying to convey time and place, which is a significant aspect of Terrell's sensibility, not just in her character, but in motive to her work. As we will hear, it is Terrell's beautiful Southern sensibility of conversation of considered thought that often imparts to and informs the work. In almost every meaningful conversation with Terrell is a personal connection and often one that has a connection to an unknown history and certainly a growing future. Terrell's work epitomizes this description, the private mind of the artist with all its flaws and gaps, inspired nuances and gestural grace are pulled together by the overarching virtuosity of a master painter. Terrell James was born in 1955 in Houston, Texas. Although her parents lived in Manhattan at that time, her mother, Beverly Cowley, chose to return to Houston shortly before giving birth, returning to New York until Terrell was aged two and a half 
whereby the family returned to live in Houston again. She has traveled and exhibited extensively in over 200 group shows and more than 50 solo installations. Her work is represented in numerous museums and private collections. Terrell is a longtime teacher, citing her decade, decades long history with the Glassell School of Art, where she mentored in studio arts and was chair of the painting department. She is fascinated by history and for five years was a processor of archives for the archives of American art. Tara lives and works in Houston with her husband, the architect Cameron Armstrong. Currently, she's working on an exhibition for Cadogan Contemporary Art in London to be accompanied by a major monograph of her life's work. It is with great pleasure that Jason McCoy and I introduce Terrell James in conversation with Stephanie Booman and Amanda Konishi. Thank you, Stephen, for this thorough introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Terrell, I'm so excited to talk to you today about your work in general, but also this la uh, last installation that we um, uh, developed for the gallery online virtual. And perhaps Amanda, we can start with the slideshow and tell we just ease into the talk by going from this um, slideshow to broader issues. Um, the show is called Circle of Intimates and um, it's an exhibition of small scale paintings. And even though it's the first exhibition ever to focus solely on small scale works, it's hardly a new endeavor. Maybe you can talk a little bit about these small paintings that you have been making in the studio for now several decades even, and um, where the idea for them stems from. Well, thank you. It's so great to be here. Stephen, thank you so much for that generous introduction. It's lovely to uh, celebrate all of these deep long-term relationships, friendships, explorations. And it's been fun working with Steffi lately on this monograph text. Um, I think, you know, the amazing thing, I had these parents who were very supportive of this idea of my love of drawing and painting, even as a small child. And so the scale of these works, Stephanie kind of goes back to even when I was 10 years old and beginning to paint with oil paint. I have paintings in my house this exact same size, actually, that I did when I was quite young in elementary school. Um, this painting on the screen right now, Between Languages, is probably the leanest of all the work. And um, I love this series. There are several in the show that really allow the breathing of the beautiful linen that is gessoed with a clear gesso, not with um, the traditional white to let the paint show through. So it, it gives a different depth. I guess um, all along I've been working on all different sizes and scales. And as Stephen mentioned, my getting to work with the archives of American art when I was in my twenties for five years. And that I think is interesting to me. I learned a lot about people's work lives and one of the people we did a lot of research on was Forrest Best. And it fascinated me when I got to be with his work, tiny pieces, some like eight by 10 could hold an entire museum wall. They just had this amazing power. So in thinking about scale, I guess, uh, I love it when my large, large works have a sense of intimacy and pulling you in. And I love it when small book size works have an impact to, to draw you in as though it's something explosive or giant on the wall. Or in this case, for instance, with the blue trees from the studio, that's a very quiet piece, but I love the, the sense of drawing and calligraphy in that one. But you would say they're independent works. They're not studies. They're no. not uh, to work through ideas that then come back in larger canvases or even the mural sized works. It's really its own endeavor. It's its own endeavor. And 
You know, I've never been one to do studies for large works. Um, somehow the thumbnail sketch idea, it just creates for me a different problem of translation. For instance, let's say this, this piece dive, I think of that as a sort of arrow that could be a feather. Well, if that were an eight foot long painting, how would I get that one stroke? I mean, would I use a mop? Would I, you know, it doesn't, it, you get in the problem of the scale of brush mark. So it's just a different thing. But maybe these are more like, you know, I, I love reading poetry every day. And I think sometimes these small pieces might be more like poems and less like short stories or even novels. Maybe we can talk about intuition since, uh, you know, you're an artist who, as you just explained, you do not work with studies or premeditated ideas. You're approaching your canvases very intuitively, very spontaneously. You live in the moment while you're making them. Um, can you maybe walk us through your painting process or your life in the studio, very private mind, the private mind of the artist as Stephen so sweetly described it. So I, I like that. Um, I would say that as any artist grows and develops, they're working out their own visual vocabulary and how it is that imagery makes sense and brings them forward in, into more meaning. So for me, um, it is a little bit difficult to describe because of the abstraction. That's one reason I think titles are important to give people a way in. Um, for instance, this is Mr. Tangle's Chancery that, you know, I've been reading um, Dickens' Bleak House. So when I was looking at this painting, after I'd finished it, I thought, what is this about? What is this sort of bumbling confusion? Does it look sort of like a court of law? And, you know, poor Mr. Tangle is one of the lawyers in the John Dice and John Dice endless law case. <laughs> and so to me, that's you know an example of things I'm reading and thinking about coming in to help me understand what an image might be telling me. So maybe it's kind of like a distorted mirror of what I'm thinking about as I'm reading. Um, intuition, I think uh, I was reading a, a little bit about what um, Jung was saying about intuition as a way into knowledge. And he said, you know, of course we know things through our senses, our five senses, but there's another way to understand and know things. And it is through this odd understanding that comes from the unconscious rather than the conscious. Do you have any, any response to that, Stephanie? <laughs> yeah. I think um, I want to go. I don't want to really let you off the hook with uh, intuition quite yet and right. uh, the visual vocabulary because I think for people who do not know your work well and they see now this collection of small works and they're all very different, very unique. And yet, for us who have followed your work for a long time, they're very much the hand of Terrell James. But in terms of palette, of density, of composition, they are incredibly uh, individualistic, and yet they form a language that's cohesive. So what is that vocabulary really, if you think about it? You say it's part of your life experiences, but is there an affinity for certain color harmonies? Is there perhaps the will of trying to find a translucence and layering? What is- Well, all of those things are true. I think- um... Vocabulary. As soon as our eyes are trying to form uh, the ability to focus as babies, we're beginning to try to make sense of the visual field. And, you know, as a painter, I think I'm doing that at a later level in my development. But I think intuitively, you know, we all have our own sense of color and color harmony and um, I think that it, it become, it's quite personal, but it, it's really the evolution of years of work of juxtaposing one, one piece, one color next to another. So, you know, I have the, the long 
the series of field studies I've worked on for so many years, starting in 1996. Um, and they're numbered, I'm now in the number 767 or something. But they are studies of color on paper that are small. And I think it's interesting because, you know, you can probably track, say, from the year 2002, look at those numbers and they'll, they'll echo in some ways the explorations I'm doing in my canvas painting. So I think it's just a way of staying engaged and interested. It has a lot to do with nature, what I'm looking at in the field, but also in the, uh, the field of the painting in the studio. So it's kind of reflecting on the process of discovery. Um, intuition is a I think a way, a way to talk about, in my case, um, the imagination and how, how it is. Like, I like it that the word image is in the word imagination, that there's some sort of way in. And I think one of the things about my work that's referential, for instance, this piece on the screen right now, I did right after I'd been in this beautiful, tiny village in China that was, uh, it's Tongli, the water town, and it's, you have to walk over bridges to get there. It's a thousand year old town and it's surrounded by water. For instance, there were people, old people with giant bronze casks, just boiling water. And they were boiling the water to flavor the water with smoke for the tea. On this little town, there's the oldest continuous tea house in China. So th there's this sort of sense of memory. Stephen mentioned space and time. I think for me, um, there's this, just, just like as writers do, you know, we're pulling forward our, our experiences to, to make sense of things and content. And I think for me, just like the way reading feeds into my imagination. So of course does living and going through different places and times with different people. Do your paintings connect you to specific experiences always? I mean, you explained this case of the thousand year old town that it's a very specific image in your mind um, that you have of a place that you have visited the time you spent there. But is that usually the case that your paintings bring you to a specific experience? No, what's usually the case is I'm painting and then I'm trying to understand where it comes from. So for instance, in this more specific geographically at least and time-wise painting title, I didn't start out trying to illustrate the memory of that place. It's just, I thought, what is this? What, what's it bringing forward to me now as meaning? So. A lot of times, you know, in a way, part of finishing a piece for me is naming it because it's trying to discern, figure out what it is that it's about for me. Where is it coming from for me? Because I don't start out with the idea of depicting anything. Do you think at all about the psychology of color, especially after doing the field studies for so long where you're really examining color combinations closely and maybe in a way distilled because they're um, so clear on paper versus layered on a can. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do think also with the field studies, there's a question about transparency and opacity and where does the light come from, from within? Is it coming back from the ground up? But um, I think when I think about color, Stephanie, it's probably a little more about emotion or feeling that comes up the way we might think of color in music. So I don't really think about it in terms of psychology, unless you want to think about emotion as being part of our psyche, of course. But I do think that there's a kind of, uh, there's certainly an emotional tone. For instance, this painting called Vagrance. I thought of this as strange little islands that were breaking off from each other, or maybe they're melting chunks of ice in our disturbed Arctic, but they have a sort of sense of meandering that I felt was pulling each other. It's like the forms are pulling away from each other, the way vagrants might want to be alone. 
Do you feel that the titles are just as important for you as a reflection on the work or is it really meant for the audience as a way in? Well, I think it's for me too, because I think it's how I move forward and decide what, what it is my content is about. So I, maybe early when I was in my, say in my 30s, I might have thought that the title was more for the viewer, but now it's certainly a big part of my own process. Do you see these works as a group that informs each other or maybe builds on each other or are they really separate meditations all kind of standing alone? Well, they're subset groups, you know, like the ones that show more of the linen. They have a little bit more of a sense of drawing or uh, Goya's Witches to me kind of floats. It has a sense of form that is levitating uh, above the ground of the painting, but also uh, sort of unleashed from gravity. Um, so there, there's that kind of, and then there, there are some of them that are more lush and buttery and involved and those tend to talk to each other. I think in the piece that I wrote for the, um, the text for the show as it's presented, I, I do sort of groupings, but yeah, they're independent, sure. You know, they're just, um, in this case, I think it's a very good looking combination and it does have a lot of range in it, but it's, like you said, it's me. If you know my work, it's it's all coming from me. This this piece that's um, on the screen right now is yeah. in the works. So it's a, going to be a 50 foot long drawing that will be installed in a an old and beautiful barn in in um, Hampshire in the UK as part of a group of works that will be at Cadogan later in the year. So uh, this has been a lot of fun to work on, and it it meanders all over the place. Some of it's very lush with color, some of it's quite open and bare, and it's been fun. You're working on different sections at the same time. Well, it's just rolling. I'm just rolling. I'm just kind of, pull. I'm like at the, I think the 48 foot now, but it's only half because the paper is only 40 inches deep or wide. And so I'm going to stack two vertical, well, two horizontal segments vertically. So it's a, the roll of paper is a hundred feet long. And so it will be cut into sections and installed that way. But it is, it's fun because it's just kind of meandering all over the place and I can't quite visualize it yet as, as one piece. So it has some surprises for me too. Can you talk a little bit about the contrast between the broader fields of color and the details, the drawn details, which is something that's a little bit more recent, I would say that you, we see it here in, in this uh, foreground here, where it's almost like these little marks made by hand that are reminiscent of note taking, maybe mm -hmm. ballpoint pen, you know, kind of a quick notation versus these very large areas of layered color. Well, the show that we did last year together online, also an artsy show, had um, discrete pieces that were, you know, regular sizes of paper that were also on this stone paper. But, you know, for me, it's a funny thing. A lot of what you do ends up being a gift back to you and to your practice. So I ended up teaching a class, uh, taking over a class for a colleague who had been in an accident and it was an advanced works on paper critique. Lots of watercolor and people using materials I hadn't used since they really were improved upon and became fine art artist materials like Marks a Lots became, you know, using real ink and real acrylic. So I started working really kind of inspired by the teaching uh, on these detailed sections that have tiny little drawing areas within fields of color, which is a different way of working. I guess I started that series, I don't know, in 2017, but began getting more detailed, like these little notations, say in the last four years. You kind of brushed through this, but I wanna shed some um, 
light on this. It's uh, a few uh, days ago when we had spoken, you talked about kind of this epiphany you had at some point, and it was in regard to light. That uh -huh. your things are not necessarily trying to capture or reflect a certain kind of light, but that the light could come from within, almost from underneath the paint, making it look a glow. Can you talk a little bit about the specific moment when you realized that? Because it was something that uh, came after years of working already and how it's manifesting? Well, I would love to because it's just the most amazing thing that happened. And I, I wish I could remember exactly which painting this was. I'll have to look through all my older work and slides, but it was when I really felt like I, Stephanie kind of knew how to paint. And it was when I wasn't just putting a bright color on top of a darker color or doing an illustration of a beam of light, but I had somehow transcended to the point where I felt that the light was coming from the back of the painting or from within the painting. So that the painting itself had a kind of light. You know, um, I'm really interested in the idea of icons and that people in, in earlier times would sit with the visage, a painting of a saint and feel as though they were in some kind of communion, communication or communion with that spirit. And I feel like when painting is really doing what it can do with, with light, um, that can happen for the viewer and for the painter too. Um, it's, it's hard to describe, you, you sort of see it in certain paintings. And I guess we could talk about Turner for that, but um, there's, it, it's just a, a, a real reward when it comes along as a painter. And these, I wish you could see them in person. You know, they're, there's, there's a real strange hovering of light, for instance, in this, this painting, Suspense, which is, um, that, that sort of white horizon line really does tend to vibrate um, both in front of and behind that gray cloud. Just because you uh, mentioned Turner, maybe we can talk a little bit about influences, some of the earliest artists who inspired you, people you find yourself perhaps even in dialogue with, um, not necessarily in a actual dialogue, but in your own private conversation in your mind. And get, get out the seance candles. And the yeah, exactly. I, um, I think my first real love was Cezanne and the way his work, especially the open Mont Saint-Victoire paintings could um, let you in behind the forms of the rocks, um, the way the color for instance, the, the quarry paintings from the Bibimu quarry um, just have an amazing sense of gravity form, but then there are these little sort of staccato marks that might be tree limbs or leaves, and they, they almost seem to move in front of the rocks. There's a, a great new book actually that um, Princeton Press has released that John Elderfield did uh, called The Rock and Quarry Paintings by Cezanne that I, I was lucky to find and order. But um, so Cezanne is one of my main fathers. I love Turner and the atmospheric work there. Goya is someone, I like the Spanish painters quite a bit. I like um, Goya's sense of um, the surreal and the dream world. I like uh, a lot of people, you know, I had a, a great experience with Joan Mitchell too when I was, I think this was in the 80s. It was a big retrospective for her at the Corcoran in Washington that I got to see that sort of energy and explos explosion of color and a kind of fearlessness of juxtaposing different color. I mean, a lot of color. Um, it's not foggy. So, I don't know. There are so many people to talk about. I, I think that being, being in Houston, we have a great influence from Mexico and mm -hmm. the Surrealists and then of the Manila Collection having such a focus on Surrealism. That, that uh, 
brings forward the sense of, you know, peeling off what's under your mind in the dream. What is, you know, that painting we just looked at called Red Eye. It's like those red dawn eyes or the Victor Hugo piece called Planet that looks like an eyeball. I just love the uh, strange association with image that isn't really in a predictable um, environment. And of course, you're a beautiful writer as well. And you've written, for example, a wonderful essay on Twombly and your experience of, of his work. Oh, I do love him. In Houston, you have this wonderful uh, Twombly collection at the Manel. Yes, love his work. I, um, I think the line, his line and sense of energy, uh, the field of line engaging the paint, the paint itself. This painting, for instance, um, Shape the Sky, it's very much a landscape, I think you can sort of imagine. But then that surprise of the viridian green on the right side, that was, you know, cover that up and you think, oh, it's a sleepy little painting. But, you know, it really does uh, add a, a weight and something perhaps a bit menacing. You know, when I was a child, uh, my mother's house had a marvelous tree, easy to climb tree. And actually this German neighbor across the street hammered little two by four pieces so my little brother could also climb it. And I had in that tree, a club. Uh, my friend, John Calloway says, this is my first teaching, but the club was called the, the monster club. And <laughs> what we would do is all you had to do to be in the club was draw, draw monsters with me up in this tree. And a lot of the children were even younger than I was. I was maybe 12 or something like 11 or 12. But it was great because you couldn't draw a monster incorrectly. It could have no eyes or 14 eyes or, you know, wasn't a judgment about that hand isn't very good. Is the worse, the better. So I think that little green viridian thing could be a monster coming into a slightly serene place. When you have a shade like this, will you keep it on your palette and maybe start a new work with it? A shape or a shade? A shade, a shade of this green when it's oh, like yeah. a very well, specific, beautiful color that obviously has some wonderful associations. What, I, what, what I would probably do, I certainly wouldn't waste it. I mean, I feel a little bit uh, guilty sometimes as a painter using the earth's minerals for this thing that might not be life-sustaining, but in some ways, let's hope it is a bit life-sustaining. But I never do waste paint. I mean, I, I might throw in a sort of ugly, muddy gray with some red to get a fascinating new background color or something. I, I might not use the pure color, but I always reuse and recombine the, the paint. What are um, some of the biggest challenges in the studio? Do you ever reach a point where nothing seems to be working, nothing seems to be going into a direction that you feel like you want to develop it further? Or is there always something else to do? Oh, th there are certainly dry spells, yeah. And there are periods when, you know, it's very frustrating because nothing is quite coming together, but, you know, there's always something more to do that you can do that might not have to do with making the work. It might just have to do with you know, all the, the sort of registrar things you have to do and all the little, like sometimes it's almost like you're lucky if 30% of your studio time is actually doing artwork. Mm -hmm. you know? And not having to, oh, get the photographer here, figure out the list, do what, you know, what's going where. But, I don't know. Um, the, challenge, the most challenging thing for so long was to work in harsh climate conditions when I didn't have a studio that actually had climate control. So, that, you know, I'm really in, in a, a lovely situation now where I, if it's freezing outside, I'm not going to have a, 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 an illness from that. Or, you know, now it's beginning to heat up here it's cool enough inside, so I'm lucky. But um, 
I think anybody who's honest with the uh, journey they're on within the exploration of their creative uh, material, the, you know, sure, there's cer certain times you just fall into the zone and that's when, you know, if you're really lucky, it's like the painting just paints itself and you're the vehicle. But then for the most part, there are 10 cases of slogging through to something like victory before that one comes along, so. Do you sometimes have a composition in your head and you try to attempt it, but you haven't reached it yet? Is there like perhaps like um, a painting in your mind that you keep following? Yeah, well, I don't know. I used to see in my really early work, like from the 80s and 90s, I used to notice that there was a kind of an arc, like a, a, a shape that would recur. But I don't think in terms of composition as much as I do in terms of layers of color and light. Um, I guess also I can always draw and put more, more drawing on that. Um, Oh, 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 well, Wolf wrote me a note and he said like that, that time when sometimes you, you wish you could repaint a painting or you have a painting that is just really works and you think, okay, I'm going to recreate this on a different scale or I love this, but you know, and it just doesn't ever work. I can't seem to copy myself very well. <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps moving on, but I, I don't know. I, um, this, the biggest struggle is probably growing, continuing to grow in your work and then um, living through periods when it's quiet and there's not a lot happening. When the, 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 there's a kind of a long distance walk with this. And, you know, sometimes there's a lot of, attention and shows and then there'll be a quieter time and I think you know at a certain point that the gift is uh, just knowing that you're you have something to say and you want to keep hearing yourself say it and how is it going to be new this this slide is um, interesting because I like the relationship between the, the field study that's on the ground and the painting that painting, unfortunately, clouded over, became a mm, big mess and looks completely different now. I mean, you, you wouldn't recognize it. Do you ever edit out work, Terrell? Or do you work on a composition until it's at a stage that you, you can let it go? Oh, uh, maybe about 10% just has to go and be thrown away or have something restretched over it. But for the most part, I can work it out. I just have to keep painting. And you know, the thing with oil painting, it's often um, just gets richer and these sort of odd textures from underneath, unlike watercolor. Once it's gone, it's gone. So there are different, different ways to deal with it. But um, I mean, I always think it's interesting to think about that for writers because you can keep these different versions mm -hmm. and then you can go back and put them back in. I think it would be almost a little maddening because how could you discern? I mean, there are too many choices or film editing, you know, um, at least when I've destroyed something, it's gone. <laughs> Um, in the last few years, you started to uh, uh, show in Europe quite a bit, in England, also in Austria. Mm -hmm. uh, you lived in Berlin. Um, that's a few years past. Um, do you find that the audience abroad sees your work differently? Since you're kind of this American abstract painter, your light in Texas is perhaps a little bit different than the Northern European experience. Well, I think so. And also, especially the Northern European experience is a, often um, considers what I do a little bit romantic, a little too organic, and it doesn't have that sort of cold, well, not cold, but the, the more limited quiet space. It, it, it's fairly active. Um, yeah, this is a show I had at Hiram Butler Gallery right before the pandemic. It was a 
a little bit before. It was like, I think January was the last month in, in 2020. So that's, uh, I don't know, Stephanie, you know, um, there's some things that I think that my drawings and works on paper have had a little more interest in, for instance, in Germany and Austria than these paintings. But I haven't, I don't know, England, there, there's quite a bit with the, the United Kingdom with the paintings, so. I mean, I, I didn't even mean commercial interests. What I, I thought was in your conversations with people there, do you find that you're having a completely different conversation with um, uh, viewers about your work, that they perhaps approach it differently because it seems a little bit more foreign and that that also perhaps gives you some new perspective on yourself? Sure, like, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, talking with other artists in other countries, I do always have a different insight. And I think the people I've talked to in Berlin and in um, Vienna about my work, they're a little more um, incisive and precise and critical, not afraid to be openly critical, whereas here we're trying to protect people a little bit. I mean, there might be a slightly less frank conversation between artists. Um, and when I've been teaching, I know a lot of times I had a lot of students from, from Europe and uh, partly because they're here because of the oil business or whatever, but they, uh, they would always begin the class and say, listen, I don't want you to just tell me what I'm doing well and what I'm doing what looks good. I want you to tell me how I can improve and what's, what's weak. So that's something that American students had rarely come up to me and said. So I think it's just a little more um, about a cultural dialogue, just like people argue about politics at dinner in a different way in different countries, you know, and we're trying sometimes to be a bit more palatable. Um. At this time, I would like to invite anybody to type in questions uh, in the chat, and I'm happy to weave them in. If there's anything you would like to ask Terrell, please type it in into the chat, and I will I will um, ask Terrell a question. Terrell, how was this past year for you? Not so much on a personal level, but in the studio. Did you find that it had an impact on your work? That you perhaps looked at the work differently, went to different materials. I mean, it was such a challenging time for, for everybody and in you know, different degrees, but did it have an impact right away? Well, uh, right away it did because I was sort of paralyzed with fear and depression and I didn't even come over here for a couple of like maybe six weeks because I just felt like everyone I knew the generation ahead of me was going to die. I was in complete horror. And then I decided, well, I could come over here. It's quite alone in this beautiful studio. And I started coming here more. And I'd say in that case, there was some amount of relief and help. For one thing, I had a place to go and a lot a place to put feelings. Also, you know, George Floyd is, grew up in Houston. And so I sort of launched away from um, sorrow into anger and that was is always a good energizer for me my work is always best when I'm either devastated or furious and not sort of rolling along happily so <laughs> there was a great a lot of ways but things but I did do a lot of work you know a lot of work during this time and I think it's also a little confusing right now because we're going back to being able to do things out in the world and meet with friends, which is a great relief, but it's also a little less time for my sense of being alone and reading and things like that. I mean, are you, are you all having that strange seesaw back and forth between being hating the isolation, but also really kind of realizing that maybe we've been living in too chaotic of a way? Um, here's a question from Ilana. I'm just going to read it out. Is the use of negative space related to the absence of the last year? Maybe she is uh, referring to the works we saw of the uh, 
uh, we have right now that are very sparse and show a lot of the um, of the. Learning. You know that's that's a it's a good question and it's probably a really good insight that I hadn't put together for myself. There are there are, <laughs> there are these isolated forms that are just hovering. So I'm sure you're right. Instead of the crowd, the big crowd we're used to. Uh, another question, do you have a favorite painting of yours? Or is it maybe something you own and live with? Do you keep your favorite paintings? Um, sometimes, not, not usually. I think it's better to let, let them out into the world like dandelion seeds in the wind, but I do keep a few. There's one I'm thinking of holding on to right now that um, I called Good Trouble. But it's kind of an, it feels like parts of glaciers breaking off. But I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of my very favorite paintings I've done, it's been fun working on this monograph and working with Wolf trying to go through images to send, for instance, to you to write about. And a lot of my favorite paintings have been in collections for years. So like the one called Shelf that you all had in New York that's living in Galveston right now. But, you know, um, it's probably kind of like when you have children and you want them to leave, and go ahead and have their own lives and grow beyond you. So I'm glad when, when they leave in a way. <laughs> well, this uh, monograph is exciting because it's really the first, even though you have done uh, many gallery um, publications as the first um, publication to really show an overview mm -hmm. of your entire work and bringing different years and different kinds of works together. So um, I'm thrilled about it. Yeah, I'm, I think so to speak. Uh, what is it like to now look so intently at old work again? Do you find yourself looking at a, a at a former self, or are you very close to these old works? Do you remember the person you were? How detached do you become, let's say, after 20 years of not seeing the work? Mm, that's such a good question. You know, I think right now, because of all this time alone and maybe just the stage I am in my life itself, I'm having all sorts of memories of myself at a younger age and other people who I don't get to be with anymore um, for various reasons. A lot of times they're just not alive anymore, but then they're just different circumstances. People move away or you just drift apart. But I've been having really in the, maybe through this COVID isolation, I've been having all sorts of very kind of rich, weird recurring memories. And some of them are triggered by looking at older work because it helps me remember what I was thinking about at that time, but also, um, you know, I think my work is always growing. And sometimes when I look at older work, I feel like, you know, I'm a kind of kind of a permissive older relative sort of saying, well, that was the young thing, you know, maybe that's a little weak on that, but, you know, so I, I see, I see um, improvement, things I can, learn from looking, looking back, certainly. But then I also um, am always thinking of the next thing. I think in a way, artists are a little bit fickle that way. I mean, a lot of my friends feel this way. It's like you're always more in love with your newest work and it might not be the best work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that, that sort of greed for new experience through your current explorations. Do you feel different about the works on paper versus the canvases? Hmm. Well, I think there's more investment of me into the paintings on canvas. There's more, it's, it's less um, facile and there's more, um, more investigation that goes back, but I do like the way I draw quite a bit. I like the line I have. And I think one, one thing that helped was when I got a little bit less in, involved with atmospheric effects in painting and started bringing line into it 
as well. So I don't know. I think working on paper used to seem faster to me, but now when I paint on a canvas with a big broad brush with the color, it's much, much more dramatic change in a day than working on a drawing, which might have these tiny little seg sections, you know, like I'm drawing these meteorites right now that are only about a half an inch big and I'm drawing them barely bigger than they are. And you know, it's very tedious, not tedious, but exact, as opposed to the way I paint, which might be more pushing a whole batch of color one into another, letting it collide. Do you feel more freedom on paper than on canvas? No, nope. not anymore. I used to. When I was a younger painter, I did used to, yeah. But I feel I feel a lot of freedom every time I touch a paintbrush too. <laughs> um, and then uh, a final question uh, for today. Um, would you say that art is a language? Yes, I think it is. I think it's a language. I think it communicates to us. I think music is a language, I think. Language, language, it's interesting. I'm reading a book right now called This Little Art and it's about translation. And it's about how a person who's translating, say a novel from one language to another has so much slippage and so much subjective meaning that has to come from that translator to the page. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even we think of language as being pretty specific, but it may be just as uh, inexact as a painting or a passage in a symphony. I don't know, it's all about interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terrell. We try to keep these talks at one hour, even though we could go on and on and on. <laughs> But um, I would like to invite everybody to um, email us questions if you have them later today. Uh, we always have to pass them on to Terrell. I hope you will um, check out the exhibition online as well as Terrell's uh, other wonderful galleries. There is Hiram Butler in Houston and there's Barry Whistler and there's uh, Cadogan Contemporary, just to name a few. And of course, uh, Charles Froelich in Portland, you know, we, uh, we admire all of them and it has been a pleasure to work together over the years and um, we all share this enthusiastic support of Terrell. So thank you. Thank heavens for all of you. I really enjoy this chance to talk and think and great questions, Stephanie. Thank you, Terrell. And thanks Stephen and Amanda as well and everybody for being here. Thanks. Thank you, Terrell. Enjoyed it. Bye. <laughs>